Hello, my name is Peter. Today I'm going to read the Bible for you guys. We're going to read in Galatians 5, verse 16 to 24. Here it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you do, are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, fractions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and like, and the likes, I want you, as I did before, that for those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. It was amazing. Just Riley and me, forever. (laughs) For 33 seconds. I'm sadness. Oh, hello. I, I'm i joy. So, can I just, if you could, I just want to fix that. <laughs> Thanks. And that was just the beginning. Headquarters only got more crowded from there. Very nice. Okay, looks like you got this. Very good. Oh, that's right, turn. Ah, look out! That's fear. He's really good at keeping Riley safe. Easy, easy, huh? Hi, back! Oh, we're good. We're good. Thank you. Good Thank job. you very much. And we're back. <laughs> Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Think it's safe? What is it? Uh, okay, uh, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yeah! I just saved our lives. Ooh. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not going to get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Riley, ah! Honey, here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh. Airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. (gasps) And you've met Sadness. She, well, she... I'm not actually sure what she does. And I've checked. There's no place for her to go. So she's good. We're good. It's all great. Anyway, these are Riley's memories, and they're mostly happy, you'll notice, not to brag. (laughs) For a talk on emotions, that movie's a gift, isn't it? It's a great movie. If you've never seen it, it's all about the five big emotions that we all experience in life. There's sadness, joy, fear, disgust and anger. And if you like, uh, you can play the game of match the HBC staff member to the various emotions. So, I mean, clearly Scotty Curtis is joy, bouncing up and down on the spot, and anger, definitely Sam Hilton. (laughs) Disgust, well, we pretty regularly see that look on Jenny Jeffrey's face during staff (laughs) meeting, especially when Pete Witt was part of the staff team. Fear even looks a little bit like Richard, and sadness is Dave Allen. And what am I? Well, I am the perfect amalgam of all of the emotions in harmony and balance, right? But the point of the movie is actually that 
A well-balanced person needs to experience and express all the emotions and not just joy because life does bring out all of the emotions, doesn't it? It's actually a really helpful movie. But in our culture, telling people that they have to experience emotions is kind of like shooting fish in a barrel, isn't it? Because we are completely in love with our emotions as a culture. We are all about the feels. So here's what one person I read this week said. The loudest voice in the Western world tells us that our emotions are everything. The things that most define us. What you feel is the most important thing about you. The highest good our culture seeks is having good feelings. Therefore, a problem with your feelings is your biggest problem. Now, given this, the next step our culture takes is quite natural. You need to be and express yourself at pretty much all costs. This is why we value getting it off your chest and letting off steam and just being honest and so on. We're instructed to handle the fragile baggage of our emotions by expressing them to the fullest, no matter what others may think, and or rearranging the furniture around us to make space for them. We applaud the courage of those who refuse to silently accept the world as it is. And he's right, isn't it? The way our world sees things is that emotions are the very most important thing about us. And bottling up your feelings, well, that's only gonna hurt you. You're gonna, we, our emotions, you gotta let them out. For us, our emotions are everything. And yet, at the same time, in the point of history that we live, we're also kind of suspicious about our emotions, aren't we? We say things like, well, that, that wasn't real. It was just my emotions talking is we kind of know that our emotions aren't always a great reflection of reality and they don't always last. So I get all steamed up about something tonight and I, I dash off that email to my boss, letting him know exactly what I think of him. But by the morning, I've cooled down. By the morning, I've started to think rationally and I wish I'd never sent it. You see, we, we love our emotions, but we also kind of value reason above emotion in our culture, don't we? Reasonable, logical people are usually seen as cleverer. And emotional people are seen as flighty and unpredictable. And in fact, in any argument, you know the person who has lost, don't you? Because they're the one that shows emotion. Reason trumps emotion every time. And so it seems like we're a bit confused about our emotions. Are they the most important thing about us? Are they something you should be suspicious of? Should we be expressing every emotion? Will I blow a flap of valve if I don't let them all come out? Are they inferior to reason? And where does God fit into all of this? Should we feel emotional toward God and Jesus? Is my Christian life stale if I don't feel lots of emotion? In fact, often churches like ours, Bible churches, are seen as being a little bit emotionally repressed. Should we be more feeling based at church. Well, some of that is what we're going to dig into today. We're going to dig into all the feels and the emotions. And we need to start with God's emotions. Remember, this series is about being human in the image of God. And so to understand emotions, we actually do need to start with God and emotion. And for a long time, in fact, for hundreds and hundreds of years, Christians said, well, God doesn't have emotions. The word they used was impassive. God is impassive. And it kind of comes from that idea that emotions are something you can't trust. I mean, when you think about it, emotions make you do rash things that your better judgment tomorrow will lead you to regret. Emotions carry you away. And we don't want a God who gets carried away by his emotions, do we? So here's what one writer said. He said, for the fathers, that's the ancient church fathers, to deny that God has emotions is to de deny him all the passions that would debilitate him or cripple him as God. To say that God is impassable or unemotional is to ensure and accentuate his perfect goodness and unalterable love. His will is determined from within, not swayed from without. You see what they were trying to protect against? They were trying to protect against a God who gets carried away by his emotions and does rash things, a God who's unstable. 
But when you think about it, our God never wakes up the next morning and says, why on earth did I send that email? Our, our God didn't say, well, look, maybe I overacted with Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe the, the heat of the moment got to me. That's not the God of the Bible, is it? No, the God of the Bible is slow to anger. The God of the Bible is measured. He's merciful. God is the ultimate in self-control. And yet, he does get angry eventually, doesn't he? God does feel. In fact, a God who feels nothing is a monster. I think this quote is one of the most powerful things I read all week. A God who cannot suffer is poorer than any man. For a God who's incapable of suffering is a being who cannot be involved. Suffering and injustice don't affect him. And he is so, and because he's so completely insensitive, he cannot be affected or shaken by anything. He cannot weep, for he has no tears. But the one who cannot suffer cannot love either. So he is a loveless being. Aristotle's God cannot love. He can only be loved by all non-divine beings by virtue of his perfection and beauty and in this way draw them to him. The unmoved mover is a loveless beloved. That's right, isn't it? A God who feels nothing is actually less than any human being. Insensitive, limited. We don't want a God who gets carried away by his emotions, but we do want a God who feels something, don't we? And when you read the Bible, of course God feels things. So he does feel anger at sin. God feels sadness when he judges. In Isaiah, when God judges Israel, he says, Surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their saviour. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. You see, God is moved by distress at judgment. He, God's heart is troubled by sin in Genesis 6. God has compassion. His heart's moved with compassion in the Psalms. He rejoices over his people. And Isaiah, you see, of course God has emotions. It's part of his perfection. Because in fact, God always feels exactly the right thing. We're going to see in a moment that our emotions get all junked up by sin. But God's emotions are always in line with truth. God's emotions are always in line with his character. So, of course, when God became a human, Jesus had perfect emotions too, didn't he? So Jesus felt pity for the man who had leprosy in Mark 1. He felt compassion for Mary and Martha, and he even wept when his friend Lazarus died. Jesus got angry when, and drove people out of the temple when they'd sinned. Jesus shows the full range of human emotions. And in fact, when we look at Jesus and God, it helps us to kind of get a handle on what emotions are. It's tricky to even define emotions, isn't it? And where they fit in who we are. But emotions seem to be linked to our values, what we love and hate. The emotions seem to rise out of the things that we love and hate and treasure and despise. Emotions seem to be tied in really tightly with our character. So one guy I read said, emotions are the dynamic gauges of what we value. When we feel an emotion regarding something, we're making a statement of its value. So joy shows that we just received something we value. Disgust is the opposite. Sadness can show that we've lost something we want. Anger shows that we perceive a threat to something we want. Fear is a similar reaction. Emotions are the colourful expression of our heart's desire. I love that last bit. Emotions are the colourful expression of our heart's desire. That seems right, doesn't it? Emotions flow out of our character and out of our heart as we respond to the world around us and to life. So of course God has emotions. And of course God's emotions are perfect. 
Because remember in week one, we saw that God is perfect in his character. God doesn't just rule the world and he doesn't just have relationships. No, God is perfect as he rules the world and he's perfect in his relationships and he's righteous and he's pure. And so God's emotions will always be perfect and good and righteous and pure. And when Jesus became a human being, he had good, perfect, righteous, pure emotions. They rose out of his good, perfect character. Now, all of that helps us as we come to look at us in the image of God. I think the reason we have emotions is because we are in the image of God. Remember from our first week, the the big thing about us as humans is that we are like God. We rule like God rules We're relational, like God's relational, and we're meant to be good, like God is good. And I think that's where our emotions fit in. Our emotions rise out of our goodness, out of our character, out of what we love. And so as humans, we're meant to have the same kinds of emotions that God does. You're meant to look at humanity and be able to say, well, I can see from them what their God is like. They love goodness the way their God loves goodness. They react and have the same emotions that God does. They're emotionally like God. And so here's how I think emotions might actually work in us. There are loads of theories about emotions, and certainly I'm no psychologist. I live with one, which is almost as good. But after a little bit of reading, here is my amateurish take on how emotions might work in us. There is the real world outside of us. There's reality that's separate from me. And in that real world, things happen, both good things and bad things. So imagine a scenario. Imagine a dog dies out in the streets. That's a reality. But then I come into contact with that reality. I see this dog lying dead in the street and I begin to interpret what happens? I use my mind. I use my reason. I use my logic to interpret it. I see that the dog was run over. I see that it was hit by a car. And I make sense of this using my reason. And of course, straight away, I'm different to God here, aren't I? Because I'm not perfect in my reasoning the way God does. I don't know everything. And so sometimes my interpretation will be wrong. But we can all do a pretty good job of interpreting. I can work it out. But I do more than that. I also personalize it. I work out what this means to me. I use my values and my character and my grid of what I love and what I hate to work out what this means to me. It was my dog that died. And I loved that dog. I've just lost something I deeply valued. What's more, it was my fault. I left the gate open. This tragedy is down to me. You see, I I personalize it. And then my emotions rise out of that. Sadness, guilt, horror, remorse, shame. See how it works? Emotions seem to come from my contact with reality as I interpret it and then I personalize it, what it means to me, my values, my desires, my heart and, and my emotions rise out of it. And so, of course, emotions are some of the best and worst of life, right? Because emotions tap into the things that are most important to us in life. They're all about what we love and what we hate and what we we take joy in and grieve over. And emotions actually help us to fully experience those things. That's why we love them so much. Imagine going through life and feeling nothing. Imagine seeing your child born and knowing that this is wonderful, but feeling no joy about it. Imagine knowing that your dog has just died and knowing that it's tragic, but feeling no grief. It would be a terrible life, wouldn't it? Emotions are some of the richest, most beautiful, most meaningful, most vivid parts of our lives. And sure, we're all wired a little bit differently. Some of us are more at home in the interpretation, reason, logic stage than others. We love to think things out. And some of us 
love to feel things more intensely and more emotionally, but we all have both, don't we? We all have emotions. I would never want to be without my emotions, even the painful ones. I'd never want to devalue them. That's why I do kind of want to push back on the over-real, over-rationalization of the 21st century. For a couple of hundred years now, we have been in love with reason and logic. You can trust your logic, but you can't trust your emotions. Reason is sound and reliable and trustworthy. It gives us a better read on reality than emotions do. That's what our culture says. But actually, our reason is just as flawed as our emotions, isn't it? Because I still interpret reality through these eyes and I can still interpret it wrongly. The fact is that our reason and our values and our emotions are all meant to work together. They're all part of how we engage with God's beautiful world. So one person I read was really helpful. They said, we can't necessarily assume that thinking is more reliable than feeling. Perhaps it's closer to the truth, biblically speaking, to say that human beings have a comprehensive set of skills for perceiving and interpreting the world and deducing truth. All these skills, rational and emotional, are fallen and all have redemptive potential for good. We're commanded to love God with a beautiful, congruent wholeness, heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is maybe the way our culture separates reason and emotion isn't actually helpful. Maybe they're designed to work together to help us to love God. But of course, that's where we run into the problem, isn't it? We live in a broken world. And so, of course, that means that to some degree, our emotions are going to be broken too, aren't they? Let me give you three ways that our emotional lives are damaged by sin. For one, there's a whole bunch of emotions that we really only experience because the world is broken. These emotions are a result of the fall. So I I watched a video that argued that there are seven primary unpleasant emotions. These these emotions are kind of like primary colors, but for the emotional world. Helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, loneliness, sadness, hurt, and fear. And the psychologist said, these are the primary unpleasant emotions. And all the other ones are kind of made up of, of mixtures of these. But they're all part of a broken world, aren't they? My guess is Adam didn't experience those things in the garden, right? But we do now because we live in a broken world. And yet it's not just us that's broken, uh, the world that's broken. We're broken too, aren't we? We're broken in all sorts of ways outside of the garden. By sickness. So outside the garden, our emotions can actually be part of how we become sick. Things like depression. But not just depression, sometimes we just struggle to have healthy emotional lives. Have you ever come across that person who just seems like they're an emotional junkie? They're they're addicted to the emotional high of drama in their life. And they're constantly looking for those dramatic experiences to make them feel like life is meaningful. And often they actually damage their lives and the people around them in order to get this emotional high because they're addicted. For others of us, our emotions can actually overwhelm us. That's me. If if you don't know me well, I'm wired pretty emotionally. I'm not necessarily the super logical person. I feel emotions very quickly and I feel emotions really strongly and I love that. In lots of ways, I love the richness of it. I love that every movie I ever watch makes me cry. But it's not always a good thing. Sometimes my emotions get on top of me, especially the painful ones. I get swamped by what I'm feeling, the loneliness, the hopelessness, the helplessness, and it means that I lose sight of reality. I lose sight of the good things that are all there. I lose sight of the hope and the help and the, the goodness that's actually there. So for me, my emotions aren't always a good read on reality. No, they often distort reality in a way that hurts me. Are you like me there? Or maybe you're the opposite. I caught up with a friend this week who said 
His sickness in emotion was that he couldn't feel anything. Something has happened at some point in his past and the way he deals with it is all emotion has just shut down. Great at recognizing emotion in others. But if you ask him what he's feeling, he can't tell you. So outside the garden, we experience emotions that we were never really meant to and we become sick in our emotions. But the third thing is we're also sinful in our emotions, aren't we? Remember, our emotions reflect our values, our loves, our hates, our character. And sin mucks all of that up. In sin, I love the wrong things. In sin, I love evil instead of good and and I hate good things. And so my emotions get all messed up. So one person I read this week said, the main hindrance is that our hearts are inclined to find joy in what God hates, to be disgusted by what he says is good, to be fearful of what he says brings life. Our emotions are corrupted by our fallen condition and we need the redemption of Jesus Christ, the only one who managed his emotions perfectly to the glory of God by valuing what God valued. That's so right, isn't it? Often I feel the wrong thing because I love the wrong thing. So I'm glad when my enemy gets hurt because I love revenge more than I love mercy. Or I feel sad when I don't get the opportunity to sin because I love pleasure more than I love purity. And my anger isn't slow like God's is. My anger is quick and harsh because I love me more than I love justice. And sometimes I act on emotions in bad ways. I do terrible things. I act on my anger. I act on my jealousy. My emotions burst forth and sweep me along and people get hurt in the process. You see, outside the garden, our emotional life gets junked up all over the place. Our emotions rise out of our values, but our values have been warped by sin. And so our emotions have been warped along with it. And in fact, sometimes... The process can even work in reverse, can't it? Sometimes our emotions can overtake and change our values. The world often does this to us, doesn't it? The world often manipulates our emotions in order to make us change our values. So they'll present this emotionally charged picture that gets me to feel something very powerfully, which makes me think, well, maybe maybe I was wrong in thinking that. Maybe I should reevaluate it. That's how it worked in the same-sex marriage debate a few years back. We had these emotionally charged ads on TV with loving same-sex couples being really heard and we had slogans like love is love and gradually our values were changed by our emotions. You see, outside the garden, our whole emotional life has actually become warped and damaged. We have emotions we never wanted to have. We get sick with emotions. We have unhealthy emotional lives and our emotions get twisted by our love of sin. And so, of course, like every single part of us, our emotions are something that need to be rescued by God and Jesus. We've seen all the way through this series that Jesus is the perfect human being. Jesus is humanity at its best and at its purest. So of course Jesus had the perfect emotional life. Someone I read this week put it perfectly. He said, we need a way that takes our emotions seriously without handing them the keys to our lives. And this is exactly what we have in the Lord, who for the joy set before him endured the cross's shame and wept tears and felt furious and even knew dismay in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because he loved his father and his precious people, he tasted deep joys and sorrows on our behalf. May our hearts grow more like his, that our feelings may follow. That's great, isn't it? Jesus wasn't broken by sin, and so his emotions weren't broken by sin. When Jesus got angry, it was a righteous anger. When Jesus was joyful, it was a righteous joy. When you meet Jesus, you meet emotion at its healthiest and at its best. 
And as Christians, we long to be like Jesus in our emotional lives. And of course, in heaven, we will be. Just have a look at this this beautiful promise of heaven from the book of Revelation. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Isn't that a beautiful promise? In heaven, emotions will be fixed. Because the world will no longer be broken. There'll be no more tears, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And we will no longer be broken. We will be able to take joy in what is truly joyful. The old order will have passed away. It's just the wonderful news of Jesus dying for our sin, isn't it? Jesus died in our place to pay for our sins. And heaven... Part of heaven is that we too, our emotional selves, will be saved as well. We'll rejoice in God. And we'll rejoice in the things God rejoices in instead of sin. And yet even before heaven, our emotions start to be changed by God and rescued by God even here. It's part of the work of the Spirit. As we become his people, God gives us new hearts. God gives us new characters and God teaches us his word. Which means as Christians, we do start to experience emotions the way God does. Emotions are meant to be part of the Christian life here and now, aren't they? My relationship with God is meant to have an emotional impact on me. So, for instance, Peter, Peter says, when I think about Jesus, when I think about how he saved me from heaven, he says, though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you don't see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. You see, Jesus gives me new emotions, right emotions, healthy, proper emotions. I'm going to heaven and I'm loved and I'm saved. And so, of course, my joy flows out of that. And the more I get to know God and the better I get to know Jesus and the more I dwell on salvation and the more I dwell on God's love for me, the more I dig into those things, the healthier my emotions will become. That's what's so wonderful about singing. The great thing about singing is when I sing truth, it draws those healthy emotions out of me. I do find myself rejoicing more. Singing is wonderful because it allows truth To shape emotion in this beautiful kind of way, it teaches me right emotions that come from God. But it's not just joy, it's also sorrow, isn't it? Of course Christians will have sorrow now because I still sin. And sometimes it's right in my Christian life that I'll grieve. Sometimes it's right in my Christian life that I'll feel sad because I've done the wrong thing. And grief can actually be really useful. It can lead me to turn back to God in 2 Corinthians. It's right that I feel anxiety for my friends who aren't saved. It's right when I see my brothers and sisters again after so many months of not being together. It's right that we feel so much joy. It's right that we cheered earlier. It's right that we feel anger when we see Jesus not being glorified. All of those emotions are part of the Christian life and they're healthy and they're good because they show that I'm learning to love what God loves and hate what God hates, and my emotions are being transformed along with my loves and hates. And look, I mightn't necessarily feel joy all the time. It's possible that sometimes I'll actually feel pretty flat. And in fact, on this side of heaven, Christians can still be ill emotionally. In fact, you know, one of the most wonderful things about Christianity is it's true regardless of what I feel. Jesus' death and resurrection and the hope of heaven, those things are true regardless of our emotions, aren't they? And in fact, this side of heaven, my emotions can still be junked up because the world is still broken and I'm still broken. But the thing is, the repair process has begun. The Holy Spirit 
is working in me. That Bible reading I had earlier in Galatians 5, Paul says, The acts of the flesh, they're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, before Jesus, before we had the spirit, our desires and our emotions were all led by our flesh, by our sinful nature. But the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, the Holy Spirit is transforming our character and our emotions get healed and transformed along with it. Instead of fits of rage, now I have love. Now I have self-control. The Holy Spirit actually transforms our emotional life along with our character. That's one of the beautiful things about Christianity. One fellow I read this week said, The Bible shows over and over again that our emotions flow from what we love and worship. This is why those who love the Lord, His people and His kingdom can actually rejoice in the face of persecution and ridicule and even physical assault for the sake of the gospel. You see, as, as Jesus changes our hearts, we can actually rejoice in different things now. Now, like I said, we're all wired differently. Some of us feel emotions really intensely. Others of us feel emotions much more mildly. That's okay. Can I suggest the key is not the strength of our emotions, but who they serve. Do your emotions, whatever their strength, help you to serve God and to love God? Or do your emotions serve sin? This is something I've really been helped by thinking through this week. I've realized my emotions, like everything else, are meant to help me to worship God. This is where we're different to that movie Inside Out. Inside Out, the movie said that a healthy human being is someone who feels all of the emotions and learns to express all of the emotions. And that's true, but the Christian goes further. Now, God tells me that the point of my emotions is to help me to worship him, not just feel and express them. Remember at the start of the talk, we, we talked about how the loudest voice in the Western world says that our emotions are everything. And the highest good that our culture seeks is having good emotions and you need to be and express yourself at all times. That is our, um, our culture turns emotions into a God. But if you're a Christian, you already have a God and your emotions are actually meant to serve him. Have a look at this beautifully insightful comment I came across this week. It said the church has its own version of this emotional obsession. For example, we often elevate emotional experience to the peak of Sunday morning worship. The goal of the sermon is to feel deeply convicted or inspired. The goal of the music is to feel a rush of ecstasy or thanksgiving. The goal of the coffee hour is to feel connected or included. This mentality often drives personal devotions as well. We evaluate it based on whether we feel Jesus' beauty or feel less anxious or feel closer to God. Please hear me, these emotions are wonderful in themselves. We ought to be moved by God's word and rejoice when sermons or songs touch our heart. But it's easy for a healthy appreciation of emotion to slide into an unhealthy emotionalism that makes emotion the point, emotion itself the point. I think he's onto something. So often, we think it's God's job to give us the emotions we want. God, it's your job to make me feel happy. God, make me feel inspired. God, make me feel loved. Make me feel warm and excited. God, you are the servant of my feelings. And we measure our Christian life by those feelings. Lots of feelings, great Christian life. Flat feelings means I'm stale. It means the Holy Spirit's missing or something. But that's a mistake. It mistakes strong feelings for genuine worship. 
and it makes God the servant of my emotions. But it's not God's job to give me the emotions that I want to have. It's my job to worship and serve God, even in my emotions. Emotions, like everything else, are meant to help me to serve God. So did you notice from Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is not more emotion? It's not more expression of emotion. It's more obedience. That is, you know that the Holy Spirit is working in you, not when you have some great emotional high, but when you have love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and even self-control. The Holy Spirit wants me to have self-control even over my emotions. And so if an emotion doesn't lead me to love and serve God and to obey God, well, that's an emotion that I don't want to have. That's an emotion that I want to bring under control. And so do you know what Christians will do? Christians will even choose to change their emotions that we might serve our God. We'll submit our emotions to God. So I might feel grumpy and uninspired about serving. I might feel really irritable because serving is inconvenient and it's costly to turn up early and stay late. And I might be tempted to say, well, look, I'm not going to serve because I don't feel joy. I mean, you've heard people say things like that. I'm not going to serve because I, I don't feel like it would come from a place of joy. But your emotions are not your God. Don't change your worship of God to fit your emotions. Change your emotions to serve your God. I choose to change my grumpiness to gratitude because serving is a privilege. Serving gives me the opportunity to look like Jesus. And so I, I read God's word. I ask God to convict me and I exercise self-control to change my grumpiness into gratitude because this is what God values and then I just go and serve. Or I feel bitter because my, my marriage isn't meeting my needs. I feel angry to God and I feel angry at my spouse and I'm tempted to leave or have an affair because I just don't feel the love anymore. But my emotions are not my God. And so I'll discipline my emotions and bring them into submission to God. I'll change bitterness to forbearance, to understanding, to compassion, and to commitment. Look, I know this is hard. I find it incredibly hard. <laughs> it's incredibly hard to submit my emotions to God. Like I said, I get swamped by my emotions. And this has been one of the hardest experiences of my whole Christian life is learning to bring my emotions to the throne of God and to say, you tell me what I'm supposed to feel here and what I should do with them. But it can be done. Self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It can be done. It changes the way we approach church. I am personally tempted to approach church by asking the question, did it give me the lift that I really wanted? Does it make me feel excited about the week to come? Did, I, did it fill the emotional need that's always sitting inside me? And don't get me wrong, I, I love it when it does. I really hope that when you come to church, it does actually shape your emotions because remember the gospel is something to feel emotional about. But you know, actually the way to measure church is not what did I feel, but did it help me to honour my God, to live for God? Did it actually work one step back from emotions and teach me what God loves and teach me what God values and teach me God's truth? Did it shape who I am as a human being so that emotions will naturally flow from that place? Because, you know, even the sermon that doesn't necessarily inspire emotion can help you to do that. 
Even the singing that doesn't necessarily rouse your heart can teach you truth and shape what you love and shape your character. And that's far more important. Don't get me wrong, I, I love emotions as part of my Christian life. I love feeling inspired. I love feeling convicted and connected. I love the power of emotions. But I'm learning to love God more. And I'm learning that the measure of truth is not my emotions. God is. And the measure of my, my emotions aren't the measure of how well my life is going. God's word is. And I'm learning to let God shape my emotions. And when my emotions lead me away from God, I'm learning that it's my emotions that have to change, not God. And I'm learning to look forward to heaven. When all of this mess of emotion will actually be exactly as they should be, just like Jesus and my fathers. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you because you are perfect in your emotions. You love what is good and pure and righteous and true. You hate what is wicked and evil and impure. And when you see good, you rejoice. Your heart warms to it and When you see evil, you get rightly, proportionally and slowly angry. And we wish we were like you. We we wish we responded to the world the way you do. And we're sorry for the way we haven't. We're sorry for the way our values and our loves and hates have become all mixed up and we take joy in all sorts of terrible things. And yet beautiful things leave us flat. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you not just for his perfection, but also for his perfect death and for the hope that we have that one day in heaven we will feel what you feel. We'll have the same values as you, the same heart as you, that we'll be healed. And we thank you for the work of the Spirit now. That is, he changes us so that we feel the right things and value the right things. We thank you that the Christian life is so pleasurable that we get to feel such joy and comfort and love and also such grief. We thank you that in the gospel and with the Holy Spirit, we start to feel things as they should be felt because our hearts are as they should be. And we pray that in the meantime, you would teach us self-control. We pray that we won't worship our emotions, but that we would use our emotions to worship you. And so when we can see that our emotions are not right, help us to repent and in the power of the Spirit, with the wisdom of your word and the help of each other, to think and then feel rightly. We pray that we will truly be self-controlled, that we might love you, that we might love the people around us better. Amen.